Okay, hi there and welcome to an updated revision presentation covering some aspects of financial market failure. Lots of topical issues at the moment in terms of financial markets, some of which may well be a feature of the exams in 2019. Uh, I'll be looking in a few minutes at contestability in banking, the extent to which uh, new, new kids on the block are changing the banking system in the UK. Lots of worries at a macro level about the high levels of household debt, both secured, that's mortgage debt, and unsecured, for example, loans on a car purchase. Important also, I think, to evaluate the impact on consumers of regulation in the UK. And we're going to cover financial regulation in a separate video. Uh, there was a question last year on financial markets in developing countries, the roles of financial markets in sustaining and enhancing growth and development and perhaps holding that back. And you'll also need to understand some of the causes and effects of financial instability. But this topic video is about financial market failure. I love this quote from Professor Joseph Stiglitz, the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist. I've likened the financial sector to the brain of the economy. It is central to the management of risk and the allocation of capital. It runs the payments mechanism, intermediates between savers and investors, providing capital to new and growing businesses. Now, when the financial markets do their jobs well, economies prosper. When it does its jobs badly, economies and societies suffer, hinting that financial market failure has genuine and systemic um, costs for many, many people. Basically, what you do in this section of the course is you focus on the generic meaning of market failure, when the market fails to allocate resources um, efficiently and equitably, and then you just apply it to financial markets. So, for example, there are many causes of potential financial market failure, externalities from instability, we'll look at that in a second, uh, the economics of monopoly power applied to banking, for example, insurance, market rigging aspects of collusion in markets, uh, the economics of speculative bubbles and potentially irrational behaviour, moral hazards, a big issue, we'll cover that, and also asymmetric information. So you take your market failure from last year, from year 12, and you try to apply those concepts, those ideas, to financial markets. That's all, you're, that's all you're expected to do. So first of all, externalities. You can make a case for saying that when the financial market is working well, it has a public good aspect. People have security and they have trust in financial markets. But equally, uh, when private sector, when the financial sector, sorry, underperforms, when there's a lot of instability and crisis, there are often some negative externalities. And this quote from the Bank of England in 2017 brings this up quite nicely. Um, although externalities exist in many markets and industries, we know that those in finance seem especially large, particularly because of what's called systemic risk, contagion effects. So uh, a problem flares up in one financial market and that can have quite big, wide ranging effects, which can damage innocent third parties. People lose their jobs, people lose incomes. Typically, financial crises tend to be predated by countries that have gone through a, a big, sharp, significant credit boom. This chart from the Bank of England looks at uh, countries where there's been a financial crisis, Spain, Japan, the US subprime crisis, China. And you can see in the years predating the financial crisis, there was a significant rise in debt as a share of GDP. Thereafter, of course, there's a credit crunch and a fall in debt. But debt is often a predictor of financial instability. And financial crises have absolutely, they have real consequences, lasting consequences. So 10 years, 11 years now after the Great Recession, GDP in the United States is, and also the UK remains well below where it might have been, could have been if you followed the green dotted line had growth followed the pre-crisis trend. According to the Bank of England, the global financial crisis cost everyone in the UK around £20,000. Now, the externalities of financial instability are often quite wide. The taxpayer, obviously, there's a cost to the government if, uh, if the state chooses to bail out banks, insurance companies, and, this, and take on their losses and their debts. There could be an increase in the tax burden. Uh, depositors, the risk of losing savings if a bank, for example, collapses, although in the UK we have a depositor protection scheme. Uh, 
Creditors, people who have lent money to financial institutions, may lose because of unpaid debts. Shareholders lose if the share price of a business collapses or if the government takes it into state ownership. Employees who lose their jobs as a result of the fallout. And governments, of course, if they have an increased fiscal deficit. In many countries, the financial sector is a big contributor to tax revenue. And obviously, when the financial sector goes pear-shaped, those tax revenues tend to decline. What are we saying here? We're saying that there are some significant externalities in financial markets. Asymmetric information is an important aspect of financial economics. Information failure may affect the buyer or the seller or both parties. And asymmetric information is where one party, the buyer or the seller, has more information, more information than another. And that can, if you like, distort the choices and the trades that take place. So you might want to point, for example, to inside information in stock markets where one, one agent has significantly more information about the performance of a, of a business and the likely movement of the share price. Uh, asymmetric information also shown in the credit market. The bank probably knows less than the debtor, the borrower, about their ability to repay debt. Particularly, the debtor has a limited credit history. You may well have come across asymmetric information in insurance markets where the buyer knows more than the seller about the likely risk. Asymmetric information can lead to moral hazard and adverse selection. Now, moral hazard comes where if you're insured against risk, if somebody has been willing to give you some insurance, then that may change, might alter your behaviour. So some people argue that if the state bails out a loss-making at risk of collapse commercial investment bank, for example, that encourages the agents running those banks to take more risks because they know that if they, if they fail, they, if they accumulate huge losses, then the state is likely to bail them out. Likewise, when you, if you look back to the subprime mortgage crisis, uh, subprime mortgages were being parceled up and resold as collateralised debt obligations or CDOs to other banks who were taking on this risk. The Big Short's a great film that shows how that was done. Well, other banks were taking on most of the risk, therefore the initial mortgage uh, lenders were taking even bigger and bigger risks in terms of who they were prepared to lend to. Moral hazard in action. You can also sit in health markets. If you, if you have a very generous health insurance policy, I don't, but if you have a generous health insurance policy, that could lead to your doctor over-prescribing you drugs that you don't necessarily need. Another aspect of market failure in the financial sector is market power and market rigging. <clears throat> market rigging, uh, first of all, is when some of the companies in the market act together to stop a market working as it should in order to give themselves an unfair advantage and an unfair gain in that sense. And price rigging in markets is illegal, has to be, surely, because it interferes with the natural forces of supply and demand. And, and harms consumers by, for example, inhibiting competition. So we've seen plenty of examples of market rigging in the past. The London interbank offer rate fixing scandal where they fixed the rate of interest. There's some allegations of fixing in foreign currency markets and in bond markets. So just recently, the world's biggest banks were accused of price fixing in, in the bond market. Uh, somebody went to jail for the LIBOR fixing scandal. And the fact the London Interbank offer, offer rate is now being phased out in part as a result of that scandal. I'm going to focus more on market power rather than market rigging. Market power as a source of financial failure. I'm sure you know this, but the UK banking sector is dominated by a handful of very, very large banks. Lloyds Group, uh, Barclays, HSBC, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland and others. So in terms of market share for all categories of business, the market in banking in the UK is clearly oligopolistic. So this, this chart shows the market share of total assets for leading British-owned banks in 2017. And you can see the dominance there of Lloyds, Barclays and HSBC and RBS just coming under 10% of assets. If you look at the market share of lending, so if you take gross lending, including mortgages, for example, personal loans and overdrafts, and look at the market share for lending 
from 2014 to 2017. Again, you see there are some big banks here with some significant market share. The market share is shown on the left-hand axis, the y-axis, as a percentage. And one way we measure the concentration of a market is by thinking about something called the concentration ratio. Uh, if we take the top five firms, which are all shown in this chart, and we add together the market share, well, in 2014, the top five firms, uh, adding together the blue bits of this chart, they accounted for 64% of all lending. So that's a good confirmation of the fact that this is an oligopolistic market. It is still essentially an oligopoly, but you can see here that in 2017, that percentage has fallen down, down to 58%. And one of the reasons is that there is now more competition in the retail banking market in the UK. And this is something I think it's important ahead of an exam to be aware of. There are, in as you'd expect in an oligopoly, there are barriers to entry. So it's not not an industry where there's free entry and exit. So you need a you need a license uh, to accept deposits and to make loans. Those licenses are given out by the central bank. So that's a regulatory barrier. There are big, heavy costs, millions of pounds to enter the market in terms of building the information technology, building the payments infrastructure, uh, the regulatory compliance, all that kind of stuff. So big and natural barriers in terms of fixed costs. The existing banks, of course, have a strategic advantage. They've built up vertical integration. They have a branch network. They have people who are well established with their bank. And some of them have first mover advantage, including strong brand loyalty. So there are some big barriers to entry in commercial banking. Uh, and behavioural economics comes into this as well. So this chart shows a survey question in 2018 question was asked which bank or financial service provider do you have your main current account with and the chart shows the percentage of people who said well my bank is x or my bank is y again you can see here that the big banks the big players in the market dominate you've probably heard of all of them about barclays santander from spain halifax lloyds natwest uh, nationwide etc part of this of course is behavioral economics at work uh, once people have chosen a bank, once people have chosen a, a current account, they're unlikely to switch. There's a very powerful default choice or habitual behaviour. So there's fairly low rates of switching, and this helps to make the market more oligopolistic because there isn't that, there isn't that kind of consumer churn from year to year. However, I think the competitive threat to the existing banks is becoming more fierce. So perhaps this market is now becoming more contestable. First of all, you have some established challenges. So Metro Bank has come in. First Direct, TSB was demerged from Lloyd's to become a standalone bank. Virgin Money, which took over, for example, the branch network of the failed business Northern Rock. So you've got some established challenges that are actually what you know quite well known now. Secondly, you have the online banks, Monzo, Zoppa, Atom, Tandem. Monzo now list, listing on the stock market and it values at something like two billion pounds. These businesses have apps, uh, they're dynamically efficient, they do things in a slightly different way. I think they're more possibly more accessible, more desirable for millennials. Online banks now becoming a challenger. Then you've got the supermarket banks. Banks Tesco have left the market, but as the money, MS Bank, Sainsbury's starting to provide banking services as part of their offer. And of course, those of you who are familiar with the, the market will know that we're seeing a wave, a surge of fintech companies, financial technology companies that are offering banking services, iZettel, Curve, Azimo. And who knows, maybe the biggest threat to the power of the existing banks, maybe the biggest challenge coming forward will be what some people are calling the next wave. So the extent to which big platform companies such as Google and Apple, perhaps Amazon, who knows, even tutor to you, the big digital platform companies are now starting to offer banking services. Services where you can save money, make transactions and perhaps even borrow money in the future. Who knows? It could well be the case that the next wave, along with the online banks, will provide a significant challenge to the market power of the UK banking sector. So this has been an update 
on aspects of financial market failure, uh, with particular reference to information asymmetries, externalities, market power and market rigging. Thanks for joining in.